Nice and thank you. Hello! On a scale of one to ten, ten being the best hello I've ever heard in my life, and one being the worst, that, my friends, is a minus 5,000. So I'll ask you again. Hello! Brilliant. Um, my name is Charlie Dark, and I'm a DJ and a poet, and I teach poetry and creative writing in schools. Um, but what I'm here today, today is to talk about my work with Run Them Crew and this organisation that I founded, and why the fact that running actually sucks. <laughs> it sucks donkey balls. <laughs> Which is a really strange thing about running, is that basically it's, a, it's a, one of the easiest things that you can do, but it's one of the things that people find most frustrating. We run for love, we run away from danger, and we run away from things we are life sometimes, and sometimes we run towards the life that we'd like to have. Um, we have to run for food. And people get very frustrated when they can't do any of these things. Now, um, I haven't always been a runner. I've been running for the last um, seven odd years. I ran a bit at school, and then I kind of went to university and discovered hip hop music, and then basically didn't do any exercise for another 20 years. <laughs> Not one iota. I was probably about three stone heavier than I am now. Um, and I wouldn't really say that there were lots of rainbows in my life. And what happened was I was commissioned to write a one-man show about my musical DJ career. And um, I was playing about 22 different characters in this show, and I had no aerobic fitness whatsoever. So what I did is I went to the shop and bought some Lycra. And that's quite embarrassing in itself, because <laughs> I'm from South London. It's like, you know, we like to wear our things loose. Now you've got to put myself into Lycra. And I start running very... Um, I went to the park and did the thing that most people do is I'm going to go to the park and I'm going to run around this park as quickly as I can because obviously I'm going to be as fit as I was when I was 15. <laughs> I go to the park, I'm on all the gear, I'm the only black guy in the park running, everyone's looking at me like I'm a bit weird, I'm not Kenyan, and I start running around... <laughs> And basically, I last about five minutes, and I have to stop. And I'm really embarrassed by the fact that this thing, this body that is excelling at DJing, it's got cars, it's got houses, it's traveling around the world, it's got all the trappings of life, can't allow me to do something as basic as run around the park. So what I do is I start running at night, because I figure if I run at night, then no one in my neighborhood is going to see me. <laughs> um, and I fall in love with running around London at night. I'm going on these epic adventures, I'm doing all this stuff, I'm making mixtapes in the studio, I'm soundtracking my London, I'm discovering all these different people and places and smells, and I'm falling back in love with London, and I'm loving it so much that I think, you know what, I need to share this with as many people as possible. Because what happened is that basically what I realised is I only ever saw my friends in DJ booths around the world, or at funerals. Because I basically um, hang out with, a, you know, with musicians, and musicians were very disorganized people, and we're very unhealthy people, and we kind, of, we kind of lead this lifestyle because we're pursuing our art, and it's all about the music, and so on and so forth. So I eventually found myself going to lots of funerals and meeting people, and these funerals were becoming like raves, like you're going to go to a funeral, there's like 2,000 people there. <laughs> um, and I figured to myself, actually, I'd kind of quite like to see my friends in the flesh. I don't want to have this virtual relationship with you where because I follow you on Instagram or on Facebook or on Twitter, I actually think that I basically know about your life. I don't know anything about your life. Basically what you're doing is you're curating your life um, to make your life seem a bit more exciting and a bit more lovely than it actually is. So I figured to myself, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to start running and I'm going to invite my friends to run. And so basically what happened was six of us Every Friday night, we would go out and we'd run a mile. And we'd post it on Facebook. We were very proud of the fact that we were running a mile, because we were doing something. I thought to myself, I don't want to call it the kind of East London Harriers. I don't want to call it the, you know, the East London Flyers. I need a name that basically, when I go to a running event, you're going to see kind of like Serpentine and Highgate, and then there's going to be like Run Them Crew. That's going to stand out. I was listening to a lot of reggae at the time, so basically I thought, I'm going to take this very reggae name and I'm going to have this running organisation. Um, also, what I realised is, I didn't have a building, but what I realised is, 
I wanted something that basically could move and could be anywhere. So we had this idea of the box. And basically this idea um, that wherever the box is, is wherever the crew is. Um, and I basically grew this organization, and we started off with a kind of round six people, and then six went to 30, and then 30 went to so on and so forth. And now, you know, uh, I'm lucky enough to kind of have the ability to run with between two and 300 people every week. We kind of turn up, we gather. And what I realized is our little crew is kind of like becoming a bit like a dining table for people who live in houses that are too small. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, that like, in my, in my day job where I work with young people, I work with lots of young people who are kind of, you know, are leading very, very difficult lives, and the pressure of living in London is very hard for them. A lot of them live in houses where, that, where there actually isn't room to have a dining table. So food is eaten on laps, it's eaten in bedrooms, and eaten in front of computers. It's, they never actually have the experience of having a communal experience with people. One of the other things that happens when you basically um, work with young people is there are young people that you work with that fly, and there are young people that you work with that disappoint you, and there's young people that you work with that need your help. And I worked with a group of young boys who basically were kind of my star poets. And we won this poetry, big poetry competition, and we went in this amazing school exchange to Chicago, and life was all wonderful, and these kids were walking around the estate and they're quoting Shakespeare, and they're really getting into words and stuff, and it's brilliant. And then, one of them decided to use his poetry skills to walk into Plasto Post Office with a shotgun, and he held the post office up. Now, obviously, I was quite upset by this behavior. Um, but one of the things that I realized is that basically he'd kind of used his poetry skills, because this boy basically was like, would never look at anyone in the eye, and he had the quietest voice. So I was actually quite impressed by the fact that he went to the post office and actually managed to get out with the money. <laughs> um, then another one of my boys um, basically decided that he was going to get into a fight with his friends, and what happened is the person they were fighting with ended up dying, and him and his whole family ended up in witness protection. You're kind of maybe wondering, like, how's the running and the kids and the so on and so forth? But what I realized is um, I knew a lot of kids that basically really hated school, but really, really loved sport. They loved the language of sport. They loved the poetry of sport. And if you think about sport, it's kind of, if you take away the soundtrack of a football game or an athletics game or whatever, it's just a game. Once you had a soundtrack to it, be it commentary, be it John Motson or whatever, or some emotive music or whatever, suddenly this thing became, becomes a bit larger than life. Um, so I started inviting some of these kids to come down and run with me. And the running community, which is very stiff, you know, they're not very used to kind of, you know, you're going to turn up to your running event in kind of basketball shorts, they're going to look at you like you're a bit weird because you haven't got little shorts on. You might be running with headphones, you're not really a runner and so on and so forth. Um, so these kids start running with me, and we basically start this project. Another thing I do is I basically make these haikus, and I start sticking them up in my area. I live in Stratford, in East London, and I was sold the dream that basically we're going to have the Olympics, and we're going to have this amazing park, and there's going to be thousands of people in the park, using the park, and it's going to be this hub of physical activity, and it's a lie. What we had is we had the hub of physical activity and we had the Olympics and we awarded the medals. And then what we did is we closed the park for a year. And then the community forgot about it. So what I thought to myself is, I don't want to live next door to this park that no one uses, so I need to start building this community. Um, so I start making these haikus and I stick them up in my neighborhood. Um, the city is my stadium, the cars are my enemies, the street is my track. And I kind of figured that at least if no one else paid any attention, I could look at some things while I was running around. Another thing that happens when you work with young people, and I always, it's the Miles Davis effect. Miles Davis, every three years, would sack his band. And he'd go and find the, the youngest and baddest players that he could find, and they'd become his new band. And it's something that I really like. I'm 43 years old. Most men that I know who are in the music industry are just grumpy. <laughs> oh, they don't play records anymore, or oh, it's not like the old days. It's not supposed to be like the old days. It's supposed to be like the future. <laughs> hey. We moan a lot, you know, it's kind of like there's a lot of moany people in this world. It's something else that I realize. And I'm running around, I'm happy. And then I'm coming back, and people are like, why are you running? Because like, it makes me happy, it makes me smile. And what I realize is like the running, it's not about the running, it's about how it makes me feel. We start gamifying London. 
with the kids. We're running around, we make these stickers. And what I realise is I'm working with kids who live in, say, for example, Peckham, have never been to Camberwell. I taught a group of 15-year-old boys who lived in Lewisham who had never been to Oxford Street and had no intentions of going. And I said, why? Don't you want to go? And they said, no, we'd really like to go, but it's unsafe for us to go. For many of the people in this room, this, you know, this may seem like craziness, but imagine being confined by your postcode. So it's not even that you're confined by north, east, south or west, or confined by your borough. You're confined by your postcode, not even your postcode now, you're confined by your road. The thing is this, if you see 20 kids in hoodies running down the road, you're going to grab your handbag and you're going to cross over. <laughs> you see 20 kids in hoodies running towards you in little shorts and vests saying, run them crew, you might actually start applauding them. And this is what started to happen, is that actually I suddenly realised that I could take young people from one area to another safely. And suddenly it became about discovery and it became about travel. I get so in, you know, amazed by this idea, I think, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to go and we're going to do a marathon. We're going to run a marathon. We're going to run 26 miles. People are looking at me like, you're crazy. Like, 26 miles is a long way. It's not really that far. <laughs> Everyone should do one at some point. Because the thing about running is, and what it's taught me, is that it was the first time in my life that I was part of something that didn't care about how much money I had in my bank account didn't care about what school I went to, didn't care about who my friends were, didn't care if I was a CEO, a billionaire, unemployed, drug dealer, gun didn't care about any of those things. All it asked me when I put my shoes on was, are you ready? And what I realised for me is that running was a really good metaphor for life. I wanted to share that with as many people as possible. So we start travelling around the world and we start accumulating medals. And then what you realise is, what for a lot of kids, um, for a lot of people in general, is kind of actually their experience of running or physical activity is basically whoever comes first, second, and third is good. Then there's the slightly larger kids that come last. And there's the kids in the middle that no one really cares about. But there's something really empowering for a young person. Um, I took a group of young people last year and we trained them to run the London Marathon. We took them from so far to finish line of the London Marathon. There was something really amazing about kind of coming, I think we were running through Stepney with one of these kids, and they were running along, and suddenly his whole community had come out to see him. And they were actually looking at this guy like he was Superman. It was the first time that strangers had come together to tell him that he was good at something. And that's a really empowering thing. Because when was the last time that a stranger, or even someone that you know in your family, came up to you and said, you know what, you're really good. I like you, you make me smile, you're important in my life, I need you around. It rarely happens. London Marathon's one of the few times that London comes out en masse and is actually like, yes, I'm willing you to succeed, I want you to be better, I want you to be the best that you can be. Um, obviously, if you're a young person, I don't want to wear black and green neon. I want to look cool because when I'm in the rest of my clothes, I'm looking cool. So basically what happens is we start making our own apparel. Um, we start making our own shoes. We basically realise that sometimes you have to trick people into physical activity. So Halloween is a big thing. So let's have a Halloween run and let's basically dress up in crazy makeup and let's go and run around the cemetery and let's basically try as many avenues as possible to try and get our community out and being active because what I found is when the community was active and smiling, life was just better, you know? After you run 26 miles, you're kind of a bit too tired to go and stab someone. You just want to just hang out. <laughs> um, my first computer cost me three and a half thousand pounds. The thing is derelict now. It has less power than my iPhone. And what I realised, I'm meeting all these kids who are saying to me, I want to make films, I want to make music, I want to do all this stuff, I want to write books. And they're saying to me, but I don't have equipment. And what I'm saying to them is, really, is actually you do. It's in your pocket, it's called the phone. So actually, let's use the phone for what it's not supposed to do. Let's take a load of pictures on Instagram and then press the book button and let's make some books via Instagram and sell them to our friends. Let's basically document. Um, the thing, the great thing about the internet, um, I love bits of it, some of it I don't like, but what it has allowed us to do is basically to connect with similar people in other sides of the world. 
And one of the things I realised from working with a lot of young people is that they think that actually no one's interested in their life, when actually they are really interested in your life, especially when you go to China. So we basically get a group of kids and we take them to China. We basically go and run the Shanghai Marathon. And we have this really amazing time. And suddenly, this little thing that I started with six of my friends has grown into this massive international movement. We're in over 50 different countries in the world. It means that basically what happens is I can go anywhere in the world and there's someone to show me around the city through runner's eyes. I've got somewhere to stay. And it's just a little kind of network that's kind of cool. Um, on one of my arms, is that one? I think it says, um, I've got a tattoo, it says, I do not run. I push the earth down with my feet and leave my footprints in the concrete behind me. And what I mean by that is that basically, I don't want to live in London. I want London to live inside me. I want to run my city. I want to be in control. I'm tired of basically being told what to do and so on and so forth. I want to have some power. And my way of basically having some power is being physically stronger than my city. So when they cancel the buses or the tubes, I'm like, cool. <laughs> it's fine. Because I know that I can run. Let's go and run 26 miles. Let's go and do it right now. Let's go and run 10 miles. Let's go and do it right now. Now, for someone like myself, you know, that's powerful, but it's even more empowering when you put that in the mind of a young person, where basically they realise, actually, that bus driver who sees us after school and never stops for us, watch me race the bus to the next bus stop and get on there. OK, um, so this is a couple of pictures of us kind of at various different races around the world. Um, you're going to see some posters and stuff here. My thing is this, is um, sometimes um, people in the community don't want to run but they can still be involved in physical activity in some way. So we're going to make some signs for London Marathon. And every year what we do now is we take over mile 21 and we make mile 21 into a carnival. And we clap the fastest Kenyan runner right the way through to the man with the fridge on his back. <laughs> yeah? Because it's a life lesson for young people to see elite athletes and also to see someone who is running 26 miles with a fridge on their back. It kind of makes them look at life slightly differently. Um, we recruit our young people, some we recommend, some we hunt down, some we go to. But basically, if you're a young person and you live in London and you basically want to come and run with us, we are always open to you. If there's anyone here, if you know someone who needs our help, send them to us and we'll take them from so far to finish line. Um, what I realise as well is that basically there's not very many intergenerational conversations happening anymore, i.e. many young people don't have elders. You know, when I was a kid, if I wasn't home by 4.15, school finished at 4, if I wasn't home by 4.15, someone in my neighbourhood would be phoning my mum and saying, your son is not home. And then my mum, when I got through the door, would be, hey, Charlie, you didn't come home on time. So, basically, <laughs> um, what we're doing for a lot of young people is we're providing, is that what, three minutes, yes? Okay, fine, we're providing elders for them, okay? I think it's important to have people in your life who you can look up to, who you can ask advice for. People who will not judge you, but definitely are just there. And what I realise when I speak to a lot of young people is, the most valuable thing someone can give you is actually not money. We need to get this out of people's heads that it's money. It's actually time. Any of these speakers here, like, I'd actually like to sit down an hour with Jake and just be like, dude, just tell me how you're doing it. You know? An hour of someone's time is more valuable than any money they can give you. Another one of the lessons that we're also trying to tell people is this. The most valuable thing that you have is not the car, it's not the possessions, it's not how many sneakers you have, it's not anything valuable, it's actually your health. Because if you don't value your health, then all this stuff that you're doing, basically, you can't profit from it. Health is wealth. And that's a really important thing that we're trying to push. So in this picture here, um, basically what we're saying was summing up. Um, Run Them Crew is about bringing people together and encouraging people to be the best that they can be. It's about rediscovering your city, be it London, be it whatever it is. It's about making the beautiful out of the mundane. It's about saying that actually that wall or that bus stop or that chicken shop or that piece of concrete that you're so willing to die over, that you will fight for, actually is beautiful and it has beauty. Don't wait for someone to come and take a picture of it and then put a branding on it and then sell it back to you. As a young person, take possession of your community and your ideas and your life and understand the value that it has. Because every young person that I've met has a story to tell, whether they're famous or not, but it has value. Um, last thing it says up here is, um, that man at the top is basically me at track. It's like, go hard or go home. 
if you're not going to do something 110%, then don't do it. And what I mean by that is we don't need any more writers, we don't need any more DJs, we don't need any more footballers, we don't need any more people. We will need people who basically wake up in the morning and say, today I am going to be the best that I can be. I'm not going to half ass I'm not going to ask someone to bring me in, I'm not going to go for a talent show, but actually I'm going to work hard because basically for the long term, because if you work hard in the, in the short term, then you get the long term payoff. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is this, is basically this um, on the right hand side is one of the fastest runners in our crew. This is a guy um, who basically, I think it's the Berlin Marathon, we're halfway through. The guy on the left, right is going for a Boston qualifying time. If you know about Boston Marathon, it's basically the only marathon that basically you have to qualify for. You cannot buy your way in, you have to qualify. You have to run a qualifying time. It's a very difficult thing to do. He sacrificed his time to help his friend home. And basically, what I realise is this, is that we all need to do a couple of things. We need to take more care of our bodies and our health. We need to value our health. We need to value each other more as well. Um, we need to mix with as many different types of people as possible so that we can learn from each other. I kind of look at running, my running community is a bit like going to the best warehouse party I've ever been to in my life. Put some posh girls in there. <laughs> Put some really bad boys in there. Just mix and fix it up and then play the most amazing soundtrack and then see what happens. That's one thing. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say to you is this. We've all got one person in our life, in our phone, who we always say, I'm going to call. I'll speak to you tomorrow. And the one thing I've realised from the running community and my life and people that I've lost early is this. Don't put off something that you could do today. Don't leave it to tomorrow. So my thing to you that I'm going to leave you with today is like, if there is a person in your life who you think needs a bit of help, needs some time, needs your ear, just needs a bit of you, Give it to them today, don't give it to them tomorrow, because you don't want to be at the funeral wishing that they were still around. My name is Charlie Dark, and I'm the founder of Run Them Crew. <laughs> Boom. <laughs>